you open to Ephesians chapter 6, where we've been the last uh, three days, Sunday morning, last, uh, last night and Monday night. I am um, very appreciative of Kevin and Jim coming and leading us on those two nights in God's Word, and um, thank you for uh, your encouragement to them. It's uh, great to be able to pass along just uh, how much uh, you communicated that you received from uh, their preaching. Uh, and certainly they are thankful to the Lord for that, and uh, they wanted me to communicate that to you. They enjoyed being with our congregation. We encourage you to pray for their congregations, and um, they uh, are gracious to have come and led us in that. So Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 through verse 20 is what we consider tonight as we wrap up the passage that we're looking at on the armor of God. And so as we think about what it is to put on that armor, it is that... In a figurative sense, we look at it as armor, right? And so in thinking about that, here's kind of the picture of what we've seen so far of what a faithful believer looks like who is putting on the armor of God. So here's how we might describe that. As a faithfully obedient and devoted follower of Christ who is persevering in faithfulness, guided by truth, right, with the belt on, Prepared for spiritual battle by having their minds guarded with truth. That's the helmet of salvation. Lives protected by a form of understanding that comes from faith and the realities of the gospel. Anchoring them in place against the attacks of Satan. That's the shield and the shoes of the gospel, right? All of it catalyzed by the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. And by what we look at tonight, prayer. You heard Kevin say the other night that prayer is the glue that holds the armor together. And that's what we want to consider tonight is the importance of prayer as part of putting on the armor of God. But I can't help but think that this week, and if this doesn't describe you, then sorry about that, all right, but... I at least want to note this because I think this is kind of where most of us go when we start talking about the armor of God. I think that it's probably true that maybe what you thought this week as we were coming to talk about this spiritual armor in what it is, that it's a little bit the opposite of what you've thought, right? Because when we start talking about the armor of God and spiritual warfare and we read a verse like, do we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places that some people start to kind of rub their hands together and they think, all right, here we go. We're going to learn how to battle demons, overcome Satan and his schemes, right? So we get to the first piece of the armor, the belt of truth. And you're like, all right, here we go, belt of truth. What is the belt of truth? And it's the word of God. And you stop and you think, okay, but yeah, but it's got to be like a special Bible, right? Like a, a Bible that we found in, in some long lost tomb somewhere, you know, it's got a special cover on it or something. We're like, no, just the Bible that you find in the pew in front of you. Right, it's just like the 20 other Bibles that you have at your house, more than likely. One available at all times on your phone that you can access at any moment of the day. Right, but we want it to be like something in a movie, right, something really dramatic, like a special cross. Right? We, we want to battle against Satan with, with these special things or like a special cross that Peter wore maybe, right, washed in the Jordan River or something like that. When we hear that the armor of God is the everyday disciplines that we practice that that we've always heard about, we've always known at least in some form or fashion. You know what we kind of think if we're honest? That's kind of boring, right? That's got to be more to it than that. I mean, it's got to be more that when we talk about this armor that we're simply talking about praying and reading the Bible and knowing the gospel and knowing what truth is. It's got to be more than that, right? And I would challenge you today that thinking that that's boring is one of Satan's schemes in our life. 
to try to downplay what we might consider the, the everyday things, to overlook these vital practices in our life because we're looking for something more dramatic, for something more over the top, for something that's more grandiose, for something that makes us more important. Because if we're honest, when we start thinking about spiritual battle, what do we want? We want to be able to say, you know what, I'm strong enough and I'm powerful enough to overcome Satan. And yet what the armor of God shows us is that you are not powerful enough. You are not able to recognize his schemes in your own strength. You're able to do that when you stand firm in the Lord and in his strength. And so here we, we realize that our failure in many cases is a lack of priority of the word of God. And a failure to pray. In some cases we could be described how Paul describes some of the women in 1 Timothy that he speaks to Timothy about who are taken by false doctrine. He says that they are always learning but never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. And in many cases that's where we are. We are surrounded by truth and believers can come to church twice a week. Hear the word, know the word, have countless resources available to them and countless things that they can use and yet they stumble around and falter and struggle because they don't know truth. Truth is not impacting their heart. So when we start thinking about prayer, it would be very easy for us to neglect prayer and that would be a mistake. In fact, probably every one of us can point to our lives and say that there are moments when we neglected the discipline and the practice of prayer because either we misunderstood what it really was or we weren't convinced of the necessity and need for it or we just didn't really think about it, did we? We were so distracted, so busy, so whatever, that we missed it. One theologian has called prayer the chief exercise of faith. And Michael Reeves, who's an author and a seminary president from over the Atlantic, said this about it, that if we fail to pray, then it's practical atheism. Right? That failing to pray is to dismiss our dependence on God because when we pray, what we are showing is our utter dependence on him. And that we know that there's no other way that we can make it than with him and that without him, we are hopeless. So think about it in this way. As we kind of turn it towards the picture of the armor of God that we've been speaking about. Imagine you are about to go into a, a battle. Let's use the illustration from Sunday morning, a battle raging right outside of these doors and you know you have to walk through it and that you're going to it. What would you do to get ready? Would you just run out there? No preparation, just thinking, hey, I'll figure it out on the way. No. If you were a soldier in an army preparing to go to battle, the first thing you would do would be to talk to a commanding officer, right? You'd probably go to the general and say, hey, what's the battle plan here? You'd want to know about the geography of the battlefield, consider where the enemy's placed, consider what the enemy does, to take a look at, at what we know about him and how he usually attacks. You're going to want to know all of those different things if you're going to battle, right? To prepare yourself. And that's what prayer is. It's preparing ourselves for the battle that is to come. Prayer is readying ourselves for the spiritual attack that we know will be upon us and is upon us. And looking at what we battle over and battle in and knowing what Paul says at the very beginning of this, we stand in the strength of the Lord. We know that prayer is vital. So look with me, if you would, at Ephesians 6, verse 10 through verse 20. Tonight we'll look at verse 18 through verse 20 particularly focusing in on what prayer is and how prayer plays into our standing firm in the midst of spiritual attack. Paul says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, 
against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. We often undervalue prayer. 1908, James Frazier was a pioneer missionary to what would be the inland parts of China, particularly to one people group. It was the Lisu people who lived on the border of of Thailand and China and uh, I guess what would be kind of the Himalaya area of uh, the mountains that would eventually lead to where Mount Everest and uh, those other peaks are. Uh, He was laboring in the foothills, and so it meant that he had to travel to very remote areas to share the gospel with people who had never heard it. And so as he would travel from village to village evangelizing and then leading services with the converts in each village, it took many years to even see a convert. But as the gospel began to move and people began to trust in Jesus, it was during the winter months that snow made travel to the villages in the highlands impossible. And so Frazier would be frustrated. And there were moments when he even questioned, God, what are you doing? How, How is it that we would see these people come to you and yet we can't get there to actually disciple them? And he sensed that God was in some senses challenging in, in that. And so he knew that it would take him three to five days to travel to these highland villages and lead services and then travel home. And he was actually unable to go. He couldn't get there because the snow had just had covered the peaks and there was no way that they could pass through. And so when the spring finally arrived and all of the snow melted away, Frazier was eager to visit these villages and check on the people who were there. What he found amazed him, that through the winter, as he had been praying, they had been reading their Bibles and praying, and he discovered that they had grown far more in their faith than his disciples in the lowlands did, who he was ministering to every day. And this is what he later wrote. He said, if I were to think after the manner of men, I would be anxious about those people who knew the Lord, afraid for their falling back into demon worship, But God is enabling me to cast all my care upon him. I am not anxious, not nervous. If I hug my care to myself instead of casting it upon him, I should never have persevered in the work so long, perhaps never even have started it. But if it is begun in him, it must be continued in him. It is that prayer brought Frazier to an understanding that it was not his own strength. It was not what he did that ultimately led to success or led to results, it was the working of the Lord. And it isn't the conviction that we see in these verses as Paul wraps up the armor of God. Why wouldn't he say and put prayer at the very beginning? Why would he put it at the end? Because it's something that he wants to leave them with. It's something that he wants them to understand that in the midst of all of this putting on the armor of God and all of the vital pieces of it that we cannot neglect and dismiss the importance of of prayer. And do you see what he does there? Prayer is not represented as a piece of armor, is it? No. He just says it straight up. Praying at all times. At all times. Let's look at prayer and what it is. As we look at these verses in verse 18, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. It's a mouthful that we get right there as he breaks down all of these aspects of prayer. And so let's dig into each one of them. First, he says, praying always, right? Always. 
What does that mean? Well, it means and, and it regards the frequency of when he should pray. And so it literally means, when you look at the word there, in every season. To pray means at all times, but Paul is using this word that means in every season. So we can think of seasons as the times when, when things begin to happen, where snow comes or spring comes or fall comes or whatever like that. Or we can think of seasons even as moments in our life, seasons of hardship and difficulty, seasons of plenty. Paul describes it in Philippians as in want and in plenty. That moments when he had needs and moments when he could not count needs, that in all of those things he trusted in the Lord. And so in this he says pray always regarding the frequency in every season we're called to pray. And so it means it is an unyield, unending and never yielding prayer. It was in 1982 that uh, the Today Show invited Reverend Billy Graham to come onto the show and when he got to the studio, one of the program's producers informed his assistant that uh, they had prepared a room for uh, Billy Graham uh, because they assumed that he would probably want to pray before he went on the air. And it was an incredible compliment to Billy Graham to assume that he would want to pray before he went on air. And what was interesting, the assistant thanked the producer for the thoughtful gesture but told him that Mr. Graham would not need the room. The producer was a bit shocked that a world-famous Christian leader would not wish to pray before being interviewed on live national television. And the assistant responded, Mr. Graham started praying when he got up this morning. He prayed while eating breakfast. He prayed on the way over in the car. And he'll probably be praying all the way through the interview. Right, we're to pray at all times, but sometimes I think we only think about prayer in the sense that it's the formal words that we speak. Now, don't hear me saying that it, it is not the words we speak, because it is. Our posture in prayer is important. Right? But don't neglect the reality that, that we should be in communication and commune with the Lord all through our day. It is that we're called to fellowship with God. We should remember that every moment provides an opportunity for fellowship, whether we are speaking out loud, whether we are praying in our thoughts, whether we are praying as we walk or praying even as we are struggling through something or as someone is speaking to us, the calling is for us to pray always, to pray at all times, in every season we're called to pray. And that should give us a conviction about prayer as it tells us when we should pray. So he says, pray always with all prayer and supplication. That regards the variety. How should we pray? I mean, are there to be differences in how we pray? And I think as Paul lays out here that, yes, there, there should be. When he uses the word prayer, it's a different word than he uses for supplication. Those are two different words. In fact, the word that he starts with in verse 18, praying at all times in the spirit. Then second time we see with all prayer, those are, are the same, essentially the same word. There are different uh, ways that it's used, but it, it's, a, it's the same word there that describes prayer. And that means speaking to or talking to, communicating with. And so the description is that we would be talking to or communicating with God. But then he says, with all prayer and supplication. Supplication is a word that means begging or pleading. What does that communicate? It communicates dependence, doesn't it? We know we can't do it ourselves to bring supplication, right, is to realize I can't take care of this. I can't do it. Do you know that we can pray sometimes in a way that, that kind of makes it seem like I've got it all handled? Right? But when we bring supplications, we know that we can do nothing in it. And what we are begging and pleading with God to do is something that only he can do. Our prayer should be in supplication, right? We should never pray without a, a realization uh, of the dependence that we have on God. But we're, there should be times when we come before the Lord begging and pleading for him to do something that only he can do. And it may say something about our faith and our confidence in what God can do if we never bring supplications to him. Because we're praying safe prayers, right? Prayers that may even point to our own understanding of or our own picture of God. Word is that John Stott had gone to a, uh, 
Uh, John Stott was a preacher in England in the earlier part of last century, and he uh, was noted to have gone to a, a village church service, and the pastor was out of town, and so one of the leaders in the church got up to give the prayer during the service, and um, he prayed for the pastor to have a good holiday, and he said, there's nothing wrong with a pastor having a good holiday. And then uh, he prayed that uh, someone's surgery would go well. And he said, and there was nothing wrong with the surgery that would go well. But he said, at that village church, he heard a prayer to a village God, right? Not a God of the universe, not a God of all things, right? What are we convinced about of what God can accomplish and God can do? And maybe we're praying far too safely that we need to pray and bring supplications for things that are worthy of who he is. Not that he's not concerned about all of the other things as well, right? But God can accomplish all things. Paul says in Ephesians earlier as he kind of ends the prayer that he's making, he says, to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than all that we can ask or imagine, to him be glory forever and ever, amen. To the one who can do far more than all that we can ask or imagine. I don't know about you, but I can imagine a lot. And he says God can do even more than that. And there's the God that we serve. So we come and we bring our prayers and supplications. We pray with all prayer and supplication. But he also gives something about how we should pray. He says being what? Alert. Being watchful in our prayers. It means to keep oneself awake. There's even the idea of it. It's it's a derivative of a word that's not used in the New Testament, but that actually is to be on the lookout for. And so it has this idea behind it that is he's calling for alertness or being watchful, that it's not just about seeing what's going on, but it's also anticipating what could happen or what will happen. And so in this context, as we're talking about the schemes of the devil that he references in verse 11 and the realities of verse 12 that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, we should see that the pointing of this is to even looking at what Satan could do in our lives, what he might do in our lives, to consider what could be a potential threat or what might come our way. Or even to think about the strategy that Satan might use in our lives. This is the idea of preparing for battle and knowing where the enemy may attack from. So he says, be alert. And I don't know about you, but there are lots of moments in my life where I don't think I'm alert enough. Not watchful enough. And then all of a sudden we realize that we're under spiritual attack and in spiritual attack. And spiritual warfare is going on and and we're not ready for it. Because we've not been watchful in prayer. We've not been awake and alert in prayer. In fact, while we were sleeping, it happened. And so he calls us to be alert. And then he says, persevering, right? And so in verse 18, the picture, at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance. With a persistence, right? And so as we think about the, the um, variety of prayer that we would be giving supplications and prayers, in this he talks about how we go after it with a persistence and a perseverance that means that we would continually do it. But also in the midst of that, that we, even when it may not seem like God is hearing or like God is working or he's not doing it on our timetable, that we don't stop, we don't quit, that we continue to pray. Reminded of those pioneer missionaries like James Frazier. Reminded of those missionaries like Hudson Taylor, like Adoniram Judson, who labored for years and years with very little result. And what did they do? They kept praying. They kept asking the Lord. They kept asking him to work. They persevered in prayer. There was a persistence about their prayer that was unyielding. And so he gives us this picture of what prayer is. But 
then he says making supplications, or again, this is the pleadings, right, the beggings, begging and asking God. And, and so with this, we see three different, I guess, classes that he gives for who to pray for, right, because that's something else that's important. We, we think about it in this picture that prayer is part of this whole armor of God that we put on and we use in the battle and to prepare for the battle and to protect ourselves in the battle, well, who should we be praying for? Well, certainly it comes at this from the idea that we pray for ourselves, right? And that's a kind of a given in the midst of this, I would think. But we pray also for all the saints, right? To that end, keeping alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Well, who are the saints? Again, it's not that team down the road, right? Don't hear that saying that you should be praying for the New Orleans Saints football team. No, that's not what he's talking about there. He's talking about the people of God. He's talking about believers in Christ. We should pray for the saints. We should pray for what the Lord is doing in their life. We should pray that the Lord would use them. We should pray for the attacks that they will face. We should pray for what's happening. And so that involves the congregation, the church, as we stand together. We pray for one another. We pray for other believers, other churches. We pray for those who are taking the gospel message to places where it's never gone. But we could endlessly go down a list of things that we should be praying for as we pray for all the saints. But the reality is we need to be praying for them, not just for ourselves, but for others. Praying that they would stand firm. Praying that the Lord would do this. And in fact, in the beginning of most every one of Paul's epistles, what does he tell, us, tell those churches he's doing for them? He's praying for them, right? Praying for the Lord to work in their midst. Praying for the Lord to work in their lives. Praying that they would come to a further knowledge of the truth. Praying that their hearts would end up being enlightened. That they would persevere and mature in their faith. That they would continue on resisting false teaching. On the list goes of how Paul was praying for these churches. But notice that he also asks them to pray for him. But I think there's a, a beauty in the midst of that prayer, and we'll look at it a little bit further in just a moment. But Paul says, pray for me, right? And in fact, that's verse 19. And, and also for me, that words may be given me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And so as we think about who we should be praying for, it is that we can be so absorbed in our own selves sometimes that the only person that we pray for is us. And that would be a mistake. Because here we see that there should be prayer given for the saints. And Paul even requests prayer for himself. And so we see in the midst of that how important our prayer is for our own standing firm in the faith and putting on the armor of God, but also that we might encourage others and pray for others to stand firm in the faith. And so Paul, as he's laying that out, lays these pictures, but I want to come back to one particular aspect of this. In verse 18, he says, praying at all times in the spirit. Well, what does that mean? Right, what, what does it mean to pray in the, the spirit? And I would say that a lot of people have been led astray by this because as we talked about earlier with our own temptation to want the grandiose, right, to, to want to be able to point to something very outward and, and kind of, you know, amplified, we, we might miss what this really means. To pray in the spirit very simply means to acknowledge God, to acknowledge our dependence on him. That when we are praying, we are not praying just throwing things out there and hopefully that somewhere in the cosmos, something picks it up and hears what we're saying and responds. To pray in the spirit is to pray directing what we pray towards our Lord. But it acknowledges something else. It acknowledges God's will and God's purposes and the realities of what he can bring in that. So to pray in the spirit is to have a submission to the will of God that would lead us to know, one, that he is all-powerful and that he is able. But also that he can accomplish literally anything at any moment. And that as God is working in the midst of that, God can do a mighty work in our lives. And so it leads us then to be surrendered to his will. 
surrender to whatever he's doing, that even in the midst of our spiritual attack, that God could use even that to bring himself glory and to use us as an instrument for doing that and to use our circumstances as very literally something that could point to the gospel and could point to the realities of what he can accomplish. And so it leads us to be surrendered to his will. That's what it is to pray in the spirit, acknowledging who the Lord is and acknowledging his power, holding up his will and accepting whatever his will is. That's what it is to pray in the spirit. So prayer readies us for the battle, gets us in that mode where we understand what could happen around us and what is happening around us. It is that prayer should be the catalyst then to lead us to put on the armor of God because in prayer we are acknowledging not only the truth of who God is and what God can do, but as we are convicted of what the scripture tells us as we're putting on the armor of God, we know that we do have an active enemy, that we are in a battle, and that that battle is something we have to stand in. And so as we think about that picture, let me give you two things that prayer does in our lives about what praying rightly does for us. First, praying rightly acknowledges what our source of strength is. Right? Praying rightly acknowledges what our source of strength is. We don't stand in our own strength. In fact, verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord. He doesn't tell them, hey, persevere, be strong, right? be good enough. No, it's this calling to be strong in the Lord. He, he makes sure that they understand that that. They're not strong in themselves. And, and just to reiterate that point, he doesn't just say be strong in the Lord. Where does he go on to say in verse 10? And in the strength of his might. Right? Paul makes, leaves no, nothing vague. He, he leaves no confusion about where the source of our strength is. And he leaves no confusion about where he believes the source of strength is to be found. And so then it's the armor of God that we put on because it is in God where the strength to stand is found. And I think we get this mixed up, don't we? We think that putting on the armor of God means that we're going to then be strong enough to stand against Satan's schemes, to fight him and battle him and overcome him in our own strength, right? And so we think of the armor of God as just a tool for us to ultimately be great. That's not what it is at all. The armor of God is literally there because what we are acknowledging is our own weakness and how much we need what he gives if we are to stand. And could it be that we have fallen and we have ultimately yielded to spiritual attack and to temptation because we have not realized that very thing? About where our source of strength is. And so as we think about this, our, our source of strength, we acknowledge that praying in the spirit acknowledges that God is in control. Just praying itself uh, demonstrates our dependence on God. And so in that, we, we would then have a submission and trust that acknowledges God's will, right? That says, Lord, I know I can't stand in this on my own. And so whatever reason I'm walking through it, whatever reason this is happening, Whatever this could lead to, God, I'll accept that. And I'll trust in you through that. Why is it so important to have the helmet of salvation? Why is it so important to bear the breastplate of righteousness? Because it's in those very places that we could be attacked to think, right, or to doubt what God can do or who God is or what he can accomplish. So the impact of God's word, what the word makes on our lives and on these things is to remind us that our faith rests in him. And so we pick up the shield of faith that Satan would love nothing more than to shoot the darts at us and cause us to doubt what God could do in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our circumstances, to doubt what he is able to accomplish even over the long picture, over the long view, God can accomplish anything. And as we trust in him, 
right? It is that we acknowledge that he is our source of strength. So our faith is firmly planted in who he is. Our trust is in what he can accomplish and do as we acknowledge what his gospel has given to us and the reality is that we could never be saved if it were not for Christ and what Jesus has given us. And so praying rightly acknowledges our source of strength, which then leads to why these pieces of armor are so important. Because when we start acknowledging our own dependence, when we start acknowledging our own weakness, well, that's when Satan would try to slip in and say, yeah, well, then what hope could you ever have? If you are those things, if you are weak that way, and if you are not able to do anything on your own, well, then you better just pack it in, right? No sense in living for God then if you can't ever be those things. But what the gospel tells us is that because even though we can't be strong, Jesus was and is, and he has given what was required, and we're not even, we don't even have to have our own righteousness. We are given the righteousness of Christ through faith. And with that, the devil flees. That's the calling to resist the devil and he will flee from you. And so here, rightly acknowledging, or praying rightly acknowledges where our source of strength is. And that's in the Lord. And that's what he provides for us. The second thing is this. Praying rightly helps us to anticipate the nature of our enemy's attack, right? Praying rightly helps us to anticipate the nature of our enemy's attack, right? It helps us to survey the battlefield, right, to think about what he's done. Because what praying should do, remember, all right, don't forget what both Kevin and Jim encouraged us. We should hear the word, read the word, right? What else? Study the word, memorize the word, and first meditate on the word. And then Kevin added a sixth, and that was pray the word. If you don't know where that's from, you can look it up. It's from the navigators. It's a hand, and it actually talks about those things that the word of God does in our life. And so praying leads us into thinking about the word. The word then leads us to pray. It is that, that those two things go to, in conjunction together. And so when we pray rightly, as we don the spiritual armor that God has given us, it allows us to think about where Satan might attack because what we acknowledge is that we know ourselves, right? But we also know that God knows us. And knowing ourselves, we know where our weaknesses are. We know what we might be tempted to yield to. We know the things that, that get us every time. And so if we know we are prone to anger, well, guess what Satan's going to try to do? He's going to try to get you as angry as possible. If he knows that you like to be somebody who gives novel information, right, that you like to be the one that informs everybody of what's going on, then guess what your temptation is? Gossip. Right? I want to be the first person to tell somebody else. We know ourselves, or well, at least we should. And the beauty of what the word of God does is as we begin to read it, it begins to expose our hearts and allows us to further see who we are, to know where we struggle. But it doesn't just leave us there, right? It is profitable for rebuke, Reproof, but also what? Correction and training in righteousness. And so it knows us, God knows us, and so as we pray rightly, we can anticipate the nature of the enemy's attack because he's going to come right for us where we are weak. Right at us when we are weak. And don't miss this. That the moment that you stand up and say, you know what? I'm going hard after God, guess what Satan's going to do? He's going to try to knock you back a few steps. He's going to try to hit you. The moment that things start going really well at the church and we're seeing good things happen and don't think that this hasn't already gone on, guess what's going to happen? Spiritual attack. Why? Because Satan uses it every time to try to discourage us from doing God's work, either because we fear or 
because he knows that we'll cower in the midst of that. He wants to just disrupt everything that he can. We can prepare for where the likely attack will come and we must prepare for it. I want to take you back to Peter. I remember what we talked about Sunday. We said that Jesus looked at Peter and said, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to what? Sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you. We know that Peter did what not long after? He denied Christ three times. But before he did that, do you remember what he did? I mean, Peter was not a scared kind of guy. He wasn't a coward. They came to arrest Jesus, and what did he do? He cut that ear right off of that soldier, right? And yet, not very long after, a little girl looks at him and says, you were with Jesus. He's like, oh, not me. How does that happen? Satan knew where Peter was weak. We must recognize where attack is going to come. Right? We might look at it and say, I'm ready to cut the ear off of anybody who comes to stand against Christ. Satan won't attack us there. He's going to attack us in the moment when he knows he can have us, where he can knock us back, cause us to falter. And so it allows us to prepare for where the likely attack will come and allows us to recognize when the attack is coming. And so through that anticipation, we can see when that attack is starting. Right? We can know what's, what's going on around us. And as we see it starting, guess what we can do? We can run to neutralize it as quickly as possible. To limit as much of the damage that Satan can cause. And so praying rightly allows us to see the attack, where it might come from. And in being ready for it, when it starts, we can limit as much as possible the damage that it does. Imagine just for a moment, right? Imagine. If two believers spending as much time in prayer, donning the armor of God, right, whenever each of them starts to feel a certain way about each other, if the Lord immediately intercepts their hearts and says, you shouldn't feel that way, and they both look at each other, you know, we were about to head down this road. We don't need to do that. Let's get this thing straight. What a beautiful picture of what God can do, and yet what happens most of the time? Now, we've already written each other off before we realized that there was an attack of Satan, right? We've already yielded to the temptation, and then we realize, oh, man, that was a spiritual attack, wasn't it? Why? Because we're not praying. So praying rightly also helps us to rightly see the path toward victory, the path of how we can overcome. In fact, Revelation, as it talks about those saints, it says that they overcame by what? By the word of God and their testimony, the power of Christ and their testimony. Right? That's the beauty of what God can do. And so in Paul's plea for prayers, we see him ultimately bring out the reality of what the victory is. And I don't want you to miss this, okay? And I know we're getting short on time, we're almost done. Right, but praying rightly allows us to see what victory is. Notice in Paul's plea and in his prayer or his plea for prayers, right, he understands what the reality of victory is because what does he ask them for? Now remember the context here. Where is Paul writing from? He's in prison, right? He's in chains. In fact, he says that. He says, for which I am an ambassador in chains in verse 20. What would you think Paul would ask them to pray for? Hey, guys, would you pray that they let me out? Would you pray I could get out of here? Instead, what does Paul ask them to pray for? And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Right? Imagine them praying in prison when they come to them and say, hey, we're going to let you go, but you can't preach this word anymore. Oh, okay, great. If you'll let us out... (laughs) We'll agree to that. What do they tell them? No, we can't help but to speak of what we have seen and heard. You won't stop us from saying that. What does Paul do? He said, I could get out of here, right? Pray for me to get out, please. No, pray for me that words may be given to me to continue to open my mouth. The reason why I'm in prison, I'm going to continue doing that. They're going to keep me in prison. But pray that I might have the words to speak as I ought to. You see, the victory is not the altering of circumstances. 
God may. Right? It's not to say you can't pray for healing. It's not to say that you can't pray that God will alter your circumstances. He might and glory to him if he does. He is certainly powerful enough and able to accomplish that. But what is the victory? We sing it. Faith is the victory. Faithfulness is the victory. And that's Paul's prayer. For the ability to continue to be faithful. To speak as he ought to speak. And so the victory in our lives is living like we ought to, right? Living like we're called to, taking up the armor of God, faithfully standing firm against the enemy's attacks and schemes, and through it all, glorifying God. And so the armor of God is what we use to stand because we're not strong enough. But graciously, God has given us the word. He's given us confidence and faith. He's given us the gospel and the understanding of it. He's given us prayer and his presence that we might stand even in the most difficult of circumstances. That we might stand against an enemy who would seek to have us. An enemy who would seek to destroy us. An enemy who would seek to take away every bit of joy that we could ever have in our lives. And what God gives us is the ability that even through all of that, to enjoy his presence and find joy in him. And so let us put on the armor of God. C.S. Lewis, Lewis's book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, um, of course talks about uh, several of the characters that we meet in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Particularly Lucy and her brother Edmund and their cousin Eustace uh, who go back to Narnia where Aslan, the lion, who is representative of Jesus, and if you don't know, the Chronicles of Narnia is kind of an allegory of Christ and his work and what God has done. So the three of them go on a voyage. They come to an island where dreams come true, and so this is also where nightmares come true, and they're on this boat, and and the ship is sailing, and the ship's crew is overcome by fear, and they begin to wildly row in the darkness toward nowhere. And so each sailor begins to hear different terrifying noises. And so it's things like huge scissors and enemies crawling up the sides of the ship. There are gongs going off and it's chaos, literally. And so what does Lucy do? She prays. She says, Aslan, if you ever loved us at all, send us help now. And I love the way C.S. Lewis describes it. He says, the darkness did not grow any less. But she began to feel a little, a very, very little better. After all, nothing has really happened to us yet, she thought. And then a ray of light falls in the ship and she sees something in it like a cross. And it's an albatross flying towards them. It circles three times, lands on their mast, and then flies ahead of them, leading them out of the darkness. But no one except Lucy knew that as it circled the mast, it whispered to her, courage, dear heart. And the voice was Aslan's. And in a few moments, the darkness turned to grayness. And then before they knew it, they were out into the sunlight. It was warm again in the ocean. And all at once, everyone realized that there was nothing to be afraid of. And there never was anything to be afraid of. And yet that's what Satan does in our lives. Right? He makes us feel isolated. He comes in and he starts making us doubt the things of God to fear the things that could happen in life. And not armed and not ready and lacking prayer, we succumb to everything that's thrown our way. And yet what C.S. Lewis demonstrates, albeit in this story, is the power of prayer. That even through all of that darkness... Even through all the darkness that we might walk through in the midst of this world, that Jesus is with us. And he leads us. And he has given us prayer. He has given us the opportunity to commune with him. In fact, through the Holy Spirit, he has put his presence in us. And he walks with us. And what a joy that is. To know that in this world of tragedy, in this world of darkness, in this world of desperation, that we are given hope in Christ. And his presence is with us, and he leads us on.
And he's given us his armor to stand firm in and with. And so my prayer would be that you would take up the armor of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication, being watchful in it that we might keep alert, right? That we might know what he's doing, persevering in it, that we would take up the armor of God. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for today. Lord, as we've reflected these few days on putting on your armor, God standing firm in it, Father, we pray that you might convict us in our own hearts, God, of the need that we have. God, you know where we are weak. You know where we have failed. God, you know where Satan is attacking us even now. We've got to pray that we would rest in you, that we would find our strength in you, and in that we would be able to stand. And so, God, I pray for each person here, that, Father, with the conviction that they are now armed with, that they would go forward into this world, seeking to glorify you through their lives. And God, we pray that you would seal these truths in our hearts, that we might follow you faithfully. It's in Christ's name we pray.